You ready in the back? All right, perfect. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll probably have some people filter in. Uh, my name is Nathan Stuck, uh, and we have an end and Scott. Uh, and we're going to uh, talk about today, uh, you're running a business first and a network second. So I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction to the topic. Uh, then they'll each go. I'll let them do their introductions as to who they are. Uh, and then I'll, I'll come back up with a couple uh, growing pains once you're, uh, once you're running that business. Uh, so why do we pick this topic? Um, well, it's not the same industry as it used to be. Uh, right? Lots of things have changed. We have a lot more equipment options. We have a lot more things and allows us to focus more on the business than the, the tech side. Um, it, our business challenges are, are much, much more uh, difficult nowadays than they used to be. Before it was all about tech and you had to solve the tech challenge. And if you solve that, then you usually did fairly well. Now it's not good enough just to solve the tech. You have to solve the business as well. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, tech is very, very important. I'm still a techie at heart. Um, but I would venture to say it's a little more plug and play uh, than it used to. And I'm going to show you some pictures that prove that. Um, so here's what we used to have to do. Um, so this picture here on, on your left-hand side, that's a CB3 with an Orinoco card in it. Uh, that didn't even have PoE. That was a, a PoE injector that you kind of had to make where you literally injected it at the bottom, you split it off, and then you still plugged in like a wall wart type of a connector to it. This doesn't even have the antenna in the picture, right? This was just, this was the box that you mounted next to the antenna when you mounted the antenna. Uh, we had to manufacture these in our garage. Uh, we had to build them and then source all the different parts. And sometimes you got the wrong pigtails in, even though you ordered the right ones. And what all did you have to do uh, to make that? So that was, that was what it used to be, much, much more difficult uh, than what it is today. Uh, the one on the right, um, that, was a, that was an access point. That was the brains where you had, had that part. That was a computer that somebody had taken out, put in an, in an outdoor enclosure, and, and made it work. That, you had an OS on there. Uh, there was no, uh, no custom hardware or anything. It was all kind of, I mean, in the upper right-hand corner, you see those two hard drives. I mean, those are real spinning hard drives, whereas now everything's on flash drives and everything. So um, fast forward to today. Uh, and that's what you pretty much buy, right? You have a CPE you can't even get into. You don't even see the electronics. All you do is plug in an Ethernet connection to it. This, this happens to be an integrated AP. Uh, so our, our technical challenges have not all been solved. I don't want to downplay tech, um, but I want to definitely set the stage that our tech challenges are, are being very, very well fulfilled by a lot of our manufacturers. Now it's on to the business challenges that we have. So our companies aren't hobbies anymore, right? Back, back in the day, it was the one or two guys out of their garage putting, putting up a customers and we were all gung-ho learning about what we had to do and, and we spent more time talking about the hardware than we did about customer service or about billing and those type of things. Um, but we're not hobbies anymore, we have employees. Uh, and those employees count on us to make the right decisions. Those employees have families and they wanna make sure that we know what we're doing running our businesses or running our divisions of our businesses. And really anymore, when we first started selling, we had wireless in our name because that was a big deal, right? Whisper Wireless. We told everybody we were Whisper Wireless because it mattered. The customer's like, well, I mean, the cable and DSL can't get me service. How do you get me service? Well, we're Whisper Wireless. Now the customers don't care. They don't care if you're fiber. I mean, they believe the media, right? And say, oh, I have to have fiber. They really don't care if it's fiber. They don't really care. All he cares is that it works, right? Can I stream my Netflix? Can I stream my Hulu? Can I do what I want on the internet all at the same time? Uh, and how much do I have to pay? That's what they care about. They really don't care about the tech side of it. So that's a little bit of an introduction as to why we chose this uh, topic. And then we're gonna kind of go through some of the things to help you uh, make that leap if you need to make the leap, or at least reconfirm that you are concentrating on the right side of, uh, uh, of your business. And with that, I'll turn on over to the nun. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Nathan. I, I appreciate it. I think just in the hallway we were talking about um, the the WISP uh, association itself and the fact that we were a single room inside of a, a bigger convention at one point. And um, that in itself is a testament to kind of the, the growth issues that we're all um, running into. So a little bit about myself. Um, been in the uh, uh, WISP industry as a vendor um, probably since pretty much the beginning, um, dating back to 2008. Um, I actually grew uh, uh, on the vendor side a business uh, to give you some context. 
uh, as a vendor while this industry was growing and while um, the industry was evolving and so on and so forth. So the um, the idea here for, for me is from a vendor perspective to kind of give you uh, a, a high level idea of some of the things that I've picked up, the nuggets that I've picked up that I think are pretty important um, to this topic uh, and then um, you know, hand it back over to, to my colleagues over here and then we can go into a, a, a Q&A. So again, um, thanks for having me. Um, Anand Butch, co-founder and CEO of NetSapiens. Um, the only thing I'll say about our company specifically is that we are a, uh, a UC uh, platform provider, um, and uh, that's the context by which I built uh, some of the information that I'm going to give you. So um, there's going to kind of be three key points. Uh, I try to crystallize these uh, these presentations down into into three key points that you guys can um, hopefully uh, create some. Uh, 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 insight from and also get you to provoke some thought and some questions that can allow you to go down a particular path and those three points that I'll talk about um, when it comes to the fact that your network as a whole or the underlying asset or, or, or what you're selling if you will is really only a means right at the end of the day um, we have to shift our mindset to understand that even though we're running a network we're building software we're providing services, at the end of the day, it's a means. And, and, and by that, what I mean is that you have really kind of key areas in, in a business that you really should try to focus on, right? And so um, from my perspective, what you see is three key things. Uh, you know, what's your purpose, right? And I'll talk about uh, profit and I'll talk about value, right? If you can really truly crystallize those things and put a high level distinction on what, why you're trying to do stuff, asking the why questions. For example, you know, uh, as Nathan pointed out, as your business grows, now it becomes from, it goes from a hobby to now taking care of a wider set of customers. Your obligations pick up, your responsibilities pick up, not only to the, uh, 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 to the economy that you, you provide services to, uh, to the employees that exist in that economy, but then also the, the, the clients that exist in that economy and then the industry as a whole. Right. So why are you doing this? And I think there's no right or wrong, but I think you do have to very clearly challenge yourself to answer those questions about why am I doing this? Right. Am I doing this for self-serving purposes? And that's and that's OK. Right. Am I doing this because I can take care of my family? But at the end of the day, um, there has to be a purpose associated of, of, of why you're doing that. Now, your network and what you're providing as a service provides a means to get that done. On the flip side, is it world changing? You, you know, you hear, um, you know, we're based out in California, and so obviously we hear a lot of the buzz uh, about up in Silicon Valley with, you know, the, the things that Elon Musk is doing and not doing and trying to not get caught for, but that's a different topic. Um, but. You, you see the excitement of folks that are really going down the path of trying to change the world. And the reality is, is that in your own sub-segment, you do have the opportunity to do that. But ask yourself that question, right? Ask yourself that question. And then ultimately, you know, are you somewhere in between? Because if you're somewhere in between, in all likelihood, there are going to be competing dimensions, right? And really try to think about those competing dimensions, all right, in terms of why you're doing something. So let, let, me, let me speak to that a little bit more. So profit, right? At the end of the day, um, a business, by definition, is meaningless without profit, right? However, um, in my humble opinion, um, if you focus on your purpose, then the profit equation is about optimizing profit, not about maximizing profit. Because when I talk about competing objectives, you may find that your purpose drives whatever your purpose may be. Maybe it's you know, I want to be the best possible wireless ISP uh, 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 in my region, but I also want to be, um, you know, the highest, uh, uh, the, the highest customer service ratings. Now, if I'm the highest customer service ratings, you may have to make distinct, you know, you may have to make distinct trade-off calls between what profit really means to you. You may choose to no, not say no to a very profitable business venture because it is actually competing against your fundamental objective or whatever your purpose may be, right? So in, in, in that case, you have to look at profit and, and again, understand that it's a means versus an end, right? We all need profit. We need profit to turn around and continue funding the business to grow. And 
but it's very important that sometimes we, we tend to forget um, the simple things that there are some competing dimensions when it comes to profit, right? If I focus strictly on the bottom line, I may actually be compromising why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? So, so keep, that, um, keep that in mind. Again, business is meaningless without, without profit. And then lastly, um, out of the three key points that I wanted to bring up was, you know, you have to identify the stakeholders. So this goes full circle back into your purpose, right? Nathan spoke about employees. Um, maybe it's the community. Maybe it's your own family. At the end of the day, everybody's fueling this engine, right? So you have to really determine who your stakeholders are and realize um, as a part of, at the end of the day, value is what you're trying to create for your st stakeholders. And that value can be based on the drivers that you individually choose. So go through the exercise in your own businesses and decide what are your value drivers? You know, as I, as I talked about before, is it revenue, right? Is, is revenue a value driver for you? Um, I can speak in, in, in the case of, for example, I talk about a means on the vendor side, uh, in the technology arena, it's very critical to make sure that you are tracking at a particular revenue level so that you can uh, show that growth and show that growth so that you can bring in investment, so that you can um, bring in uh, additional financing from the bank so that you can continue to fulfill your purpose, right? But understand what those things are. What is revenue? Is it subscribers, right? We, we, we obviously, I think some of the gents are going to ask some questions and survey about where everybody is from a subscriber standpoint. Is subscribers um, one of your uh, uh, value propositions, right? Or is that one of your key drivers? Is IP or other assets your key drivers, right? Um, and in other assets, we, we talk about people as well. Like, understand what your key drivers are for what identifies value. Um, you know, if, if somebody was going to come in and, um, you know, merge with you or and going to the last point here, if, if you have an end game in mind, right, an end game that um, says, okay, you know, I want to get to a particular point of subscribers and then, hey, maybe I've, I've added enough value that somebody's going to come in and look at us in acquisition, or for that matter, I get to a particular uh, set of subscribers. Now I want to get to a level of scale where, hey, you know, I don't necessarily want to be the owner operator. I just want to be the owner um, and look to growing uh, the, the folks that I have within my organization to take that role over, right? So all very, very important questions uh, to ask. And all things that, you know, it's not one or the other, right? Go through the exercise to really understand which pieces of these are important to you. Let that dictate um, what your business modeling should be, should be about. And then with respect to that, establish a growth rate. I talked about profit, right? You can have a very, very profitable business, right, but not be growing potentially, right? So again, determine what your growth rate should be based on the end game that you have in mind. Maybe you want to run, run a legacy business. Maybe you want to create a nice nest egg, make it a family business, that's okay, right? That's, that's your plan. Maybe you want to grow and scale and look to um, start growing beyond the markets that you're in and expanding the business and, and, and going nationwide and going international or whatever it may be or going into other product lines and so on and so forth. Again, based on that, establish a growth rate. It's really important to establish that growth rate because that'll allow you to set the goals to manage your business by. So even though you have a, a, you know, a, a profit goal, if you will, a, a profit um, target, if you will, make sure that you understand what the growth rate needs to be associated with that profit that's going to allow you to get to your end game um, ultimately within the time frame you want to get to that, get to that end game by. Right? So, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, what it's about is those three key pieces, right? Your, your, your network should only be one element of the big picture, right? It should really be purpose driven, uh, an engine, right, that, that actually generates profit for you so that you can fulfill. Uh, your purpose and grow value, right, for all of your stakeholders. And the reason I wanted to kind of simplify this piece is many times, and, and we, we have to do this even at, at you know, uh, just to give you a context, we have uh, 40 people at the company and we have a growing a group and we've been growing at, um, you know, at a pretty rapid rate. But even at, at this level of growth, you're constantly going back and asking yourself that question, right? And so we do this even today 
to make sure that we're tracking in the right direction. But if you start that practice today, right, if you start that practice, no matter what level you're at, um, you'll find that you can at least start to uh, create the boundaries by which the box that you want to play in. It just helps you um, really crystallize your thinking of how you run your business first uh, and your network second. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Scott Peen. I'll be the next speaker. Before I get started, I had a want to take a quick poll of who is here. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people here have 300 or less subs uh, in their network? All right, thank you. Then, uh, by a show of hands, who here is either owner or financial in charge of money? Okay, <laughs> perfect. All right, so starts to, uh, it's good to understand the perspective that I am coming from, so that's why I put this slide up. I am not the owner of the company, but I have a slightly different perspective than a lot of the employees, so it gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. Okay. All right, what I think is one of the most important things is uh, personalities. Yes, there's the technical, everything else, but personality traits. I strongly, strongly believe that you should have somebody within your company that has a very different personality than you that you either must listen to or will try to listen to most of the time. Uh, a number of years ago, I did one of those personality tests. I think they're colors or they give you the four main personality traits. As an owner, as a money person, or as a manager, if you have not taken one of those, I strongly recommend to find one of those personality tests and take them. Uh, the one I did had your natural personality, what you underlying are when you're relaxed, and then what you've been forced to become through life experiences and work. So I believe one of the things is uh, with the owner of the company and myself, we do have very different personalities and that helps us be a foil against each other. So a lot of times I'll go off on one end, he'll go off on the other and we meet in the middle. We have avoided a massive amount of financial mistakes just because we have two very different personalities. You've got two people, two owners that have the same personality. Try to find somebody else that uh, you have to listen to. All right, next most important is money. Um, there's a lot of people that have issue and they have to go out in the financial places here. We were very successful with our local banking. Um, our owner uh, became very familiar with our local bank, uh, his local bankers. We also happened to do computer work for the bank, so he knew the bank knew our company was very comfortable with it. But visit your banker on a regular basis so that when you have a special uh, a wisp fire sale where you get to buy 30 subs for 35 bucks a sub you can go in and it doesn't take you weeks you can get approval for that money very quickly um, once you have a little money uh, or you have some capital built up in your business line of credit very very good interest rates are going to kill you um, We've found that the SBA loans are not your best option if you can find anything else. The interest rates are higher and the paperwork will drown you. So it's a massive distraction. So if you can go with local lending, spend the time, get to know your banker, uh, that'll save you a lot of time and it's one of the best options we've found. Now, with business, and this was taught by my owner, follow the money. If it doesn't pay, don't do it. When in doubt, first question you ask yourself is, is there money in it? Couple things that, um, this is where having the different personalities comes in. Uh, as a technical background, as the, the guy that manages the network, I'll say, oh, I want this thing or I want that thing. And then the owner comes and says, well, how is that going to make money and can we do it for less? The same thing. Well, yeah, but it's not as good of a technical thing. 
well, let's uh, pay attention to your money, and uh, if it's not going to make money or you can do it for less, do it. A couple examples on there. Um, oh, school cabling job. So, good example of following the money. Uh, I'm very good at going into a school, gutting all the computer wiring, uh, and replacing it with Cat 6. Do this over two weeks, it's $80,000. Once I started really looking at it, uh, in the state we're in, uh, we have prevailing wage. So the employees get paid 65 bucks an hour while they're working on the job. Employees love it. We're required by the government to pay them that much. We bid the job for that. We started really looking at how much money the company makes, and it's like, you know, it's fun for the employees, they make money, but it's kind of a distraction for the company. Um, $10,000, two weeks, eh. Then we started really seriously evaluating our cabling jobs. They were, they were becoming a distraction for us. All right, company structure. So we started with an IT company. Uh, we've been an IT company for like 30 years. When we started the internet, I saw, I saw its potential. I also am very uh, possessive, so I pretty much got out of the uh, IT portion of the company very quickly. Everybody we hired for the wireless became 100% wireless very quickly. For me, that allows priorities. So the internet priorities were my priorities. That's where I made the money come. The computer side of the company, they had their own responsibility. Depends on how you structure your company, but I found very effective to separate them, separate managers, separate financial requirements. Yes, it's all the same pot of money that the owner collects or comes out of the paychecks, but having people with their own priorities, uh, managers and then the individual staff, helps out tremendously. Yes, you can share staff occasionally, but I really like separating them for us. For the business, um, this is just more of a tidbit, my personal opinion, customer comes first. So for us, uh, we have, my saying is we have a good product, at a fair price, backed by excellent customer service. Customer service is what separates us from everybody else. There's wireless carriers in our area, there's cable, there's DSL. We have excellent customer service. Part of the customer service is, how do you run your network? Be upfront. I have right now a tower that's oversubscribed. I'm telling the people, Parts are on order, I'll have it in in two, three weeks, and we actually ordered the parts, we didn't lie. We ordered the parts, we're putting the equipment up. Um, priorities throughout the day as far as how I prioritize things. This seems slightly counterintuitive. Install service call surveys. So as I'm planning things, or I have, there's always gonna be more work to do than you have time or you have money to hire employees to do. So you prioritize. Installs, service calls, surveys. The flip side that seems to be the exact opposite, but isn't really, is current customers come first. Now, when you have storms, things go completely south. Installs get pushed off, uh, towers get fixed first, current customers get fixed, but during normal operation, install, service call, surveys. That is the order of the priority. All the employees understand it, um, and it works out quite well. We're still able to get service calls in within 24 hours, so good customer service. And we have found half of our new signups are from referrals. Referrals seems like one of the free, lowest cost marketing. I tend to disagree. Referrals are the most expensive possible marketing you're ever gonna come across. To get a referral, you've gotta run a good network, clean, great customer service. It's great to have them, it means you're doing it right, but it is one of the most expensive types of marketing I've come across. OPEX, uh, operating expense. Yes, sir? Yeah, I was worried about that. Let me see if I can, is this, can I set this? All right. Yeah, I was worried about my height here. All right. 
controlling your operating expense day-to-day -day money is going to serve you the most. So when you want to buy that new whatchamajigger, new backhaul, new license link, um, if you don't control your monthly expenses and watch those like a hawk, you're going to be limited on what you can do. It will then hurt you when you want to or you need to upgrade every customer's antenna every five years. It'll limit you. So control your operating expenses. Tower rent. We have a lot of people that are happy to pay $300 and $800 a month on tower rent. There's a lot of our competition. They'll pay $500 a month, not think anything of it, get 20 people out of it. That's so gonna hurt you. Try to get your tower expenses a lot less. I realize they vary by region. For our area in the Midwest, we typically are under $100 a month for 120 feet. And that helps us, helps us on our monthly expenses and that allows us to put the money back into the business uh, to make a better product for our customers. Lower cost to accomplish labor is something I wanted to expand on. You're going to have times when you'll have highly repetitive tasks. They may be very complex, but they're extremely repetitive. For instance, you have to do a firmware update to an antenna, and you have 100 antennas you want to apply it to. We frequently will bring in employees' children and sit them down. It's 10 steps. We make them write it down and they're happy for uh, five hours a day. We don't have to pay them $20 an hour. They're happy, they're out of trouble, they make some money, and we're lowering our cost to do this, do a firmware upgrade, because I'd have to pay somebody $12 to $20 an hour to do it otherwise. So do look for ways, continually look, how can I accomplish the same thing, the same quality, or very close, for less money? We take that philosophy on our tower sites, uh, the boxes we do, how we design stuff, constantly looking for a way to do same thing for less money or make it a better product for the same money. And that's it for my presentation. Look at that, 11 minutes. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into um, a little bit of my transition, my journey from going from the technical side of things to, uh, to the business side. Um, I always thought I was a technical person, that's my background, I have a computer science degree, I've always been gravitating toward tech. Uh, but when I went back and looked at things, I found out I was actually a serial entrepreneur, really. Um, I have dyslexia, so I spell at a, a third grade level and read at a sixth grade level, so I had to go to summer school, but I had a lemonade stand. Uh, we made about $80 a day. We sold candy and lemonade, and I had employees, my brother and two best friends. Uh, my mom shut it down after about three weeks because she was tired of taking me to the store all the time uh, to, to, to buy the next thing I needed. Um, I also mowed lawns. Um, I sold candy at my high school, just not quite like this, more like this, because uh, you weren't allowed to sell candy at the high school, uh, but I did it anyway. I'm a little concerned that this is being recorded because I, I was a loan shark in high school. Um, I didn't know that it was a loan shark. Um, what I did was we had a track meet every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, this was in seventh grade. I would lend money to my friends, um, and that way they could buy whatever they wanted at the fast food when we were stopping from the track meet. And I guess maybe in seventh grade, I, it was a little weird because I would make them sign a piece of paper that said, I so-and-so will pay Nathan Stuke back. And I thought I was being a really nice guy because if you pay me back the next day, I didn't charge you any interest. It was if you borrowed $2, you paid me back $2. Um, every day after that, though, it doubled. I mean, that was fair, right? I mean, but, you know, we, we didn't count weekends, and, and we didn't count holidays, and if I was sick from school, we didn't count it, and if you were sick, we didn't count it. Um, and so I had the bully of the school owing me over $2 million, and I told him, listen, if you just pay me $200, i will write off the rest. You would do that for me? I'm like, yes, absolutely. I, I think I lent him $2. Um, ultimately, that business got shut down, though, because the next year the, the school did an analysis of their absentees and kept asking why people were gone so much, and they found out that they were gone because they owed me money. Uh, so it got, kind of got shut down. Probably a good thing because I didn't realize I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, but Whisper is what I've been growing for the last uh, 15 years, and, and we're now up to 78 employees. Uh, we have five remote offices, and that's, that's our team as of a couple weeks ago. We had a big, big party uh, with our 15-year uh, birthday. 
Uh, so before I go into kind of my transition, I always like to say that you define success, right? It doesn't matter if you want to be a 300 customer WISP, a 3,000 customer WISP, or a 3, 3 million customer WISP. If you define success, you'll always be successful. As I mentioned in the opening, I was on the U.S. national swim team. Um, my success was that to be the best swimmer I possibly could. Uh, unfortunately, my sport wasn't in the Olympics at the time. I did open water. Um, but I'm happy to say that my best time in the 10K is still faster than the gold medal time in the last three Olympics. So it doesn't mean I'd be guaranteed a gold medal, but it means I would have been in contention. So I define my success, though. I don't let other people define it. Because if you do that, then you'll be successful. There will always be somebody more successful than you if you let them define your success. So no matter if we're talking how big we are or how small, just keep that in mind. So I, I want to start by prefacing it with checkers versus chess. Um, I really think that when I was technical, I started the business as the tech side. I, I came from programming. That's what I did. I was like an IT consultant, and I was all about the tech. And I was about making those radios I showed you pictures of at the beginning and everything, and what do we do? Uh, and and I, w I was really kind of concerned about going to uh, the, the business side of things, running a business. That's what I always wanted, but I didn't know it. I didn't realize I was a serial entrepreneur. I thought everyone thought the way I did and always had a business. I didn't, I didn't know the difference. Um, but I, I like in chess versus checkers is chess, you, you have multiple dimensions, right? The pieces move differently. They fit together differently. Whereas in checkers, you have one dimension. You can only move one direction. You can only move one way. Um, so when you're thinking about that transition or you're thinking about your business, definitely think about the, the, um, the chess side of things, how you put all those pieces together. And, and I don't want to downplay the tech side at all because it's just as important as the marketing, as the sales, as everything. But when you move them all around as pieces, uh, like Anand said, it becomes one piece of a bigger, a bigger puzzle. Uh, so back in 2008, I realized that everything revolved around me and the company and I was the bottleneck. Right, I always joke that I was a CEO by default because I own the company, not because I deserve to be uh, um, the CEO. Uh, and I woke up one morning back then, we had about uh, 2 million in revenue, about 17 uh, employees. And I said, oh my goodness, I own a real business, right? I'm bigger than 99% of the businesses in the US. I have these 17 employees that are relying on me to make really good decisions. Uh, and I was a little concerned about that because I was the tech person and I probably wasn't running the business the way I needed to. Uh, so then I found uh, Audible, and I started reading lots and lots of books. All of these books I've read, I have more than 400 in my, uh, in, in my, um, my library. Uh, I have a book list. That I've, I've kind of broken them all down. But what I would do is I'd go out and read a book. And since I have dyslexia, I, I listen to them. So I listen at three times speed. I would, I would listen to a book in one week, and then I'd come back and be like, all right, guys, my leadership team, we're going to do this. And they're like, okay, cool. And then the next week, I'm like, oh, I read this next book, and this is what we're going to do. And they're like, well, wait a minute, uh, okay. And then the third week, hey, we're gonna do this. And they're like, well, hold on, we haven't even finished implementing what you said the first week. I'm like, well, hurry up, let's go, you know? And then they finally stopped me and they said, well, what are we gonna do next? Well, I don't know, I haven't read that book yet. Uh, so we, we worked on kind of what that looks like. Uh, we found EOS, the traction model, which a lot of you know I, I talk about, uh, and we implemented that. And that really, really allowed us to catapult our business. And, and this session isn't about talking about that, but it's just, it was a key thing that allowed us to really, really grow. Uh, and, and as you transition, you know, I found that I actually liked the business side better. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. I, I was in Air Force ROTC for my first year, and I decided not to continue because I didn't want to manage people. That's what officers do is manage people. I wanted to play with computers and technology. And now I find that I really actually like the tech or the, the, the managing people better, uh, except different than being in the Air Force. It's on my terms versus somebody else's terms. Uh, so now I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about some of the growing pains that you're going to face uh, as, a, as an owner and as, as a business. Um, so owning a business is hard, no question about it. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? If it was easy, we wouldn't have employees. Everybody would own their own business and it'd be, be no problems at all. Um, everyone is a Monday, Monday morning quarterback. I, I have some very, very talented employees that always tell us after the fact how we should have run something. So it's like, really? Oh, that's a great idea. Why didn't you come up with that before? Well, you know, so you put them in charge and then all of a sudden they can't make a decision because when it's your name on the line and you have to make that decision, it's a lot harder to make a decision than when it's after the fact and said, well, I would have done this and I would have done that differently. So it's okay to feel like everybody's a morning, uh, Monday morning quarterback. Uh, and things are not always as they seem. I, I love this grass is, you know, grass is always greener on the other side uh, until you get over there and find out they just spray painted it. 
uh, right? I, I've talked to many, many WISP and business owners that it's amazing, everything is great, and you know, it, we've done a lot of acquisitions, so we should buy them for millions of dollars. And then you read in the paper the next month that they're going out of business or something wasn't going right. It's like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't jive. So be careful. Don't, don't always compare yourself to the next guy because usually they're inflating numbers or they're saying something. Just be very realistic and know that it isn't as green on the other side as they might make it out to be. Uh, it's never too early to, to insist on good financial numbers. You don't have to be a financial expert. You don't have to understand everything. Uh, but you need to be very, very careful and make sure you have all your finances in, ro in a row, whether you're going for bank financing or whether you're just trying to make sure you're actually making money, right? It's very, very difficult to analyze anything after the fact if the numbers are all over. You might be making bad business decisions thinking you're making a lot of money, but when you actually had good information, you'll find out you're not. Uh, documentate everything, document, document, document. Uh, we had several really good employees early on. Uh, that were amazing. Didn't matter what time of day you called them, they, they, they answered their phone. They knew everything about the network and everything. Great. I want you to go on vacation. I want you not to be tied to your phone. I want another employee to be able to go out to that same tower and be able to do the work they need to do. I don't want it all locked in your head. Uh, so insist on having good documentation. Your good employees will be willing to do that and say, yes, it, it's a pain or yes, it takes me time, but they'll be willing to put it in the systems they need. Uh, contracts are a must as well. You need to make sure you don't just blow those off. Um, one day, hopefully, you want to be big. And as the bigger you get, the more those contracts are important. Uh, so you want to make sure you take the time uh, early on. Uh, the dynamics of your team will change as well. So right now, most of you who are smaller probably wear multiple hats. You have lots of different, what am I doing today? Who's responsible for what? Um, as you grow, you tend to have a little bit more silos. You specialize in things, and that's okay. Uh, but you just need to be aware that that's going to happen. And it's going to feel like, why does, it, why does one customer have to jump through three different departments to get something done for them? Well, it kind of comes with growing bigger. Doesn't mean it's right. Maybe you train all of your, your customer support people to be able to do billing, sales, and tech support because you want one place to be able to do it. But you just need to be aware that you tend to become more uh, siloed as you grow. Um, we've also had the problem where people feel like they're left out of decisions. When we were very small, everybody in the room, everybody made decisions, and now we, we push decisions down from our leadership team. We ask for their feedback, but it still feels different because they weren't in that initial meeting. Uh, and it's just something you have to kind of, uh, kind of look for and, and try, to, try to solve. Um, but it's, it's a growing pain that you're going to end up uh, having to deal with. Uh, this, is a, this is a big one, especially if, you, if you're growing very quickly. Um, Whisper has outgrown several of our very key employees, um, but these are employees I've known forever. They've helped me get where I am. But th that's saying that you know, am, am, th those who got you here aren't necessarily the ones that will get you there. Uh, it's because you've outgrown them. They, some of my employees thought that they didn't need any personal development. They thought that they could handle everything. And then all of a sudden the company's two to three times the size and they aren't performing as well. They went from being a rock star to being barely holding on to being a hindrance. And as a leader, you have to deal with that. And it's hard because you, you know these people and, and you want to keep teaching them and training them. Uh, but if they choose not to, uh, then you have to worry about how do you transition someone who's been with your company for a very long time. Uh, but it's a, just a natural evolution of what, uh, what you've been going through uh, as you grow. Uh, cash is king. Um, this one, I mean, even big companies, if you can't make payroll next week, you have a problem. Uh, so cash is king, cash is king. Uh, that's been my biggest struggle through the whole growth of Whisper is just, do I have enough cash to keep growing? Do I have enough cash to keep up with the demand? And the answer is always no. Um, but it's always, how do I get more? How do I get more? What do I need to do? Uh, and, and you have to make sure you manage to that cash. Uh, so another one that a lot of people run into is when to move to a new location. Um, we moved into two new buildings last year. Probably not a good idea to do it at the same time. We had two different offices that were moving. It disrupted our whole flow of our company. It was something desperately needed. Um, I, we were in a 125-year-old barn. I love the old barn. I always wanted to have a high-tech company in an old barn. I had it. But we had two people in every office, including mine, three people in a hallway, two departments we couldn't hire anybody else for. And I didn't realize how compressed we were until we moved in. It was 15,000 square feet, warehouse included. Now we're in 72,000 square feet, warehouse included. We have four conference rooms. We only had one back then. And like within a week of moving into the new building, I was looking for a, a, a conference room to have a meeting with somebody and all four of our conference rooms were taken. I was like, this is amazing, this is great, but I didn't realize how much it was hamstringing my company. We were on three different floors in the old barn, now we're all on one. 
Uh, so you need to take into account what that, what that looks like for your company and start making those decisions. You may be bumping up against the wall of your location, not necessarily your company's growth, but that location. Um, I've also seen lots of companies have two locations, sometimes like the warehouse is on one side of town and the office is on the other. We have remote offices, but it's typically four and five hours away for those remote offices. I, I like having everybody together. That's just my personal feeling. I like being able to walk to the back and see what's going on at the warehouse. Um, it, it, it just, that's something I like to do. I understand why people do the two locations, but something you really need to think about, is it really worth me splitting up my company where my employees get to say, well, warehouse, they never do anything. Well, office, they never do anything. Oh my goodness, you guys are both working really hard, but you don't see what each other are doing. Uh, the other one is missed opportunities. As you grow, um, you'll feel like, at least I feel like I, I've missed more opportunities than I've taken advantage of because there's so much opportunities out there for WISP. That's why I think it's a great time to be a WISP. Um, but that's okay. You always hopefully have more opportunities than you can handle. Uh, and, but you have to make that priority decision of where do you grow, what do you do, where do you use your capital. I, I know back um, many, many years ago, I was on a, a panel with uh, Jeff Kohler, and I was mentioning that, you know, at this time, it was probably five, probably eight years ago, we were spending $40,000 a month on equipment. And, and, and I, if eight years ago, you told me I'd be spending $100,000 a month on equipment, I would have been like, yeah, sure, absolutely. That'd solve all my problems. I mean, 100,000 would be great. Uh, and then I, I grew and Jeff's like, well, I'm spending like 1.2 million and all I need is 1.8 million every month. I'm like, ooh, so it never, it never goes away, right? It doesn't matter how big you get, you still always need more cash. You always need to more, do more growth. Uh, so it's okay to miss some of your employees. Uh, and you have to be careful with uh, employee uh, burnout. Uh, if you're pedal to the metal all the time, uh, you, can have, you can lose some of your really good employees uh, just because you're always pushing so hard. The other one, I, I, I take this one from my consulting days when I would come in. Um, Band-aiding, a lot of times we spend a lot of time fixing the symptom, not the root cause of the problem. You didn't ask the question why enough. You didn't actually look down there and say, okay, what is the real cause of this? You spend all this money fixing it and it ends up being a Band-Aid. Uh, I love going to other WISPs and talking to them and I have never had a WISP yet when I ask them, you know, well, what's your sales process? What's your install process? They usually go through their install process and in the process of going through it, you remove two steps. Well, I don't know why we do that anymore. I mean, the old firmware, we used to have to do that, but we still require our guys to do that. And just in the process of talking to me about it, we remove steps from the system because nobody went back to really evaluate. Uh, so you gotta make sure you're not stuck doing uh, Band-Aids. Uh, a strategic plan will help you with that, where you can get in and you say, okay, this is where we're going, this is what we're driving, L let's keep moving forward. Uh, and I like to fix things even if they're not broken. Gotta make sure we're not just spinning our wheels, but we look at things over and over and say, what happens when we get to 300 installs a month? What happens when we get to 1,000 installs a month? Saving five minutes per install is a big deal. Whereas when we were only doing 100 installs a month, saving five minutes an install wasn't as big of a deal. But we keep pushing for that because we have a strategic plan as to, to where we want to go. Uh, so the last one, this one a lot of people are, are probably, at least I, I'm going to share this with you because I, I think we all go through it, but we don't want to admit it. Um, it's okay for your motivation for the company to wax and wane. It's okay for you to wake up some days and be like, oh my goodness, this WISP industry is hard. I don't want to go into work today. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have to do. And then there's other days you're going to be like, I am flying high. I just signed my, my local healthcare and they're going to buy 10 links from me. And this is going to be great. This is amazing. Or I got to play with this new piece of equipment. And, and it's okay to have those ups and downs. Now you have to make the decision though, is how do you walk into your company as a leader? Because your personality and your ups and downs will be your company's ups and downs. So you need to keep your ups and downs personally with you. If you have a mentor, you can talk to them about it. Um, but you need to be, be, no matter how much you try to cover up your downs, people are gonna know it. Uh, but it's okay to have those. It isn't like everything's just rocket and you're gonna go, uh, it's okay to be like, mm, am I really doing this right or what's going on? Uh, take time off too. I know that's something really hard for a lot of us owners to do. Uh, there's always way too much work to get done. How many over all-nighters are we pulling? What are we doing? You need to take that time off. You'd be amazed. My wife being from South Africa, we go back there, unfortunately not enough, but when we do, it's 30 days. Uh, and I went back uh, 30 days. I answered four emails while I was gone, and that was about a class I was, I was uh, guest speaking in. And I came back with such a renewed 
a vigor for the company and what we wanted to do. I also came back to a record number of installs, a record low number of, uh, of cancellations and everything. So I stood up in front of the company and said, I know, I'm the problem in the company, I'm taking another month off. So I took two months off and, and it was really good though because it made other people step up and, and do their part of what they needed to do. Uh, so I encourage you to take that time off. Uh, and one of the ways you kind of help yourself take that time off is do you own your company um, or, or do you not? So could you take off a week? Could you take off a month? Could you take off a year and have your company be just as profitable or more profitable uh, than when you were there? Now, don't get me wrong. If you were there, hopefully you would make it even more profitable because you're one more person and you're driving it. But that's a good way. I've always wanted to own my business. You know, on paper, I own 100%. In reality, I probably own 80% and it owns me 20% of the time, right? There's still 20% of the things that I'm the only one in the company can do. I'm the only one that makes the decision on that. But I'm always working towards that 100% ownership where I, I have things running the way I want them running. And yes, it runs better with me there, but it still runs really, really well with, with, not me, there, with me not there. Uh, the other one I struggled with for years um, was paying myself. Uh, always needed more money in the company, always needed more money in the company. I look through how many ever, you know, millions and millions of dollars we've had come through over the 15 years. And if I had just taken 1%, right, I wouldn't have any personal debt. Uh, my kids wouldn't be like, hey, daddy, uh, I understand you won this really big contract with the government. How come you won't buy us a new swimsuit? Well, because I don't have the cash to buy you that new swimsuit yet. You know, it's coming and those things. So when you think about uh, your business, it's okay for you to take money out of it. You take all the risk. I, I look at my employees and I was always like, well, no, let me give them the raise first and let me, let me get them the car first because they really need it and let me do this. I own the company, I'm building wealth, I'm building whatever. And then when I really came back to it, I said, wait a minute, I'm the one signing on the dotted line for the, the contracts. I'm the one signing on the dotted line for the bank loans. And, and heaven forbid something happen and, and they call the bank loans. All my employees, yes, they have to find another job and that's fine. I have to pay all that back and, and I'm on the hook for that. They're not on the hook for that. I'm taking the risk. So it's okay to be paying yourself. Set those goals out to make sure you pay yourself um, because if you don't pay yourself, uh, you'll always need more money. You'll always get to the point where now it's a stress and you, you don't have the family life that you, that you should and that balance. So I, I would encourage you to, to set down some real goals. I know it's hard when you're smaller. Believe me, it's hard when you're bigger too. Um, because we're all dedicated to our businesses and it's always like, but I need 120%. How can I take 1% out of 120%? I need more than I have, but I would really encourage you to make sure uh, you start paying yourself. Uh, and with that, we've got a couple minutes. We can open it up to questions to anybody on the panel and uh, we'll do the best job we can to answer whatever you have. I don't know if you want to sit over and then get yeah. open both. All right, anybody have any questions? If you could come up to the mic or shout it loud and we'll repeat them so that way we can pick it up on the video. Yeah, a quick question for you, I uh, for all three of you. So if most of you guys come from a tech history, did you find somebody from tech to kind of take on the legacy? Or do you purposely find that person that's different than you so you can still maintain the CEO being the tech minded but somebody else kind of compliments you in different ways? Um, let me, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'll touch on that. Actually, what I, what I didn't touch on is that when we founded NetSapiens, I was fortunate enough um, to have a CTO and a partner who basically did say, I'm going to take on the tech part, right? So in, in my case, specifically, even though I was wearing a technical hat for the longest time because we were developing software, in our case, um, there was always a path for somebody. But in the same vein, it, it's the same issue, right? Because he's a co-owner. Uh, the same issue exists in terms of, okay, what if that co-owner wants to go do something else or wants to grow into a different part of the business, so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, 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 in my case, I was fortunate, and that was actually a key point there, is that whenever you start transitioning or saying, okay, I want to take the next level and start pushing in one direction, it's very key to find that trusted partner that, you know, can wear that hat. For us, one thing to keep in mind is technically I'm an employee, um, but the following statement is one I've worked through for the entire life of the company. It is my goal, I continually, every day, try to make myself obsolete. So I will train all the people underneath me as much as they are capable to do my job. For the person that doesn't completely understand that, um, it's scary. 
What I have found is by making myself obsolete, I become more valuable, I grow the company, and I make more money. So um, as owners, it should be fairly easy. Try to make yourself obsolete. What tasks people took on at what times was based for us mostly on who we had, uh, what their skill sets were, how they matured. Um, I had a person, a lady that became my right hand. She's taken on more and more technical aspects. I still do some really core technical portions of the network. And when people can't figure stuff out, I'm the guy they come to. But as an owner, try to make yourself obsolete. Yeah, I think that's a great point. For, for me in my transition, it, uh, we had hired a technical person through an acquisition. We, we bought a company, he came with it. And it was like two years after he'd been working for us, I'm like, wait a minute, why am I doing all the tech? I was doing all the research, I was doing the R&D he's supposed to be doing that. So we had this discussion about how I wanted him to do more of the research and development, which is what he loved anyway. And, and then we transitioned me into more of the CEO role. I mean, we didn't have titles forever in the company. So it wasn't that I was CTO and he wasn't. It was just, well, I, I was the go-to person for, for Canopy. I was the go-to person for the tech because I had started the business. <coughs> it turns out he's a way better tech person than me. Uh, which is great because that's what I wanted. I wanted somebody stronger. I understand the concepts now. I understand why we need to do MPLS or why we need to do BGP, um, but he implements them for me. I, I don't want to learn how to implement them. I've got other things now that I've transitioned into worrying about. So, but it was, a, it was definitely a accidental, looking back, I wish I would have done it on purpose, uh, but it was an accidental transition for me at first, so. Yeah, I think just to, just to touch on that a little bit too, I think this is in, in relation to having different mindsets and different approaches to solving the same problem. In my case, um, with my particular business partner, um, we may solve problems differently and there were many times where, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to be trained in a, in a, in a very um, critical thinking environment. And so there were many times where I thought I was right, he thought he was right. The way I built something would be different than the way he built something and and that's the piece that you almost have to let go because it's not so much the how right it's it's being it's being okay with the result and focusing on the result knowing that you're just trying to divide and conquer and achieve the same thing at the end of the day right so. Perfect. next question okay right here in the front and you can get up line up behind the mic if you want that way so many of us here are in the earlier stages, and so if you could go back to yourself in the early times, what would be the advice to watch out for this, or I wish I would have done that? If I could just hear from each of you what that might be, that would be lovely. Mm. So my advice to myself would have been to uh, join or go to the session la yesterday um, on uh, starting a WISP 101. <laughs> we talked about all of those for four hours. Uh, but I think my advice would be um, you're the lid of the company. You're the limitation in the company if you're an owner. Uh, so you need to grow as an owner. And that means you need to take personal responsibility for your personal growth. And if I had realized that much earlier on, uh, I love doing it, but I didn't realize that was what I had to do. Uh, and once I did, then the company went like this because my personality went like this, my understanding and knowledge went like that, and the company came along with it. Um, truly start running the business the way you envision running the business from an economic standpoint, day one. Um, even if you can't pay yourself, um, uh, even if you, 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 you think you want to get to a particular point, start booking it that way right? Um, that way you can start seeing the cost of the business and you can start making decisions on how to cover that cost and get the profitability. Okay. So <clears throat> as m like most WISPs here that are new, uh, we find ourselves chasing money a lot because we didn't start off properly funded. So uh, my question, I guess, is how do you decide when to turn down projects that create revenue instead of growing the WISP like you need to so that you have a proper company. In other words, doing cable jobs work for a little bit. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you wanna go ahead? For us, or for many of you, the first, first item will be uh, how much capital can you get? Uh, 
do you have enough or are you able to go out and get loans? For us, uh, we took within, I believe, 24 months, I think we went through about a million dollars. Uh, we happen to have the ability, though, to do the capital. So what you do is going to be highly dependent on the capital. The next will be, what is your vision? So about two months after we started, I laid out a five-year business plan. I remember we had a partner with an electrical co-op, got in front of their board and said, we'll have a thousand customers in three years. And they all laughed at me and giggled. That three years had a thousand customers. Um, so a lot of it's gonna be dependent on your money and then it's gonna be your vision. If you don't have the money, you can't do it. If you do have limited cash, then you have to look at short-term and long-term profitability. There are times when you're gonna to need to have a lot of quick, you're gonna to need to have some cash quick. Sounds real good, but you're building an asset. So when possible, you want to be expanding your network, more towers, but if you need a lot of cash quick, those cabling jobs, $10,000 real quick, two weeks, get paid in a month, it helps a little bit, but it distracts from building a long-term asset. So I think for me, um, we've never had enough capital, never had any cash really. Uh, I convinced my wife it was a good idea to put $36,000 across three, three of our credit cards because everybody needed internet, <laughs> just not in 2003. Um, but when you're thinking of it, think outside the box. We did our first 12 acquisitions, we've done 27. We did our first 12 acquisitions, what's, what's called seller finance. I went to these people who wanted to sell their business and they're like, great, cut me a check for this. I'm like, huh, don't have a check, can't get a bank to say yes. Uh, and they're like, well, how are you gonna buy me? I'm like, if I'm gonna buy you, you have to finance it. I didn't even know that was a thing. I just, only way I could come up with the cash was if they provided it, where I would pay them a monthly fee. So think outside the box, uh, do whatever projects you need to do. I, I took my first paycheck three and a half years after I started Whisper. And I would go up to Chicago and program, right? That was, that was my day job, if you will. I did it, you know, I'd work for 90 hours in a week and then go back home and work on Whisper for three months and then go back up there and do that. So when you're small, cash is king, you do whatever you have to. Maybe you don't want to do <coughs> consulting, but you know what, it pays pretty well. Maybe you don't want to do this job, but, you know, do those so you can afford. Uh, but be real creative. Um, we have now, for the first time ever, we have a bank in the, in the exhibit hall that's willing to, in looking at funding WISP. I've talked to 78 banks to try to get a USDA loan. I finally got one, it took me three years. I have audited financials, I have a proven track record. It is hard to get money uh, at any scale from a bank. Um, but we have one now that's very interested in our industry. We have leasing companies that are very inter interested in our industry. So you can be creative to get the cash you need. But it kind of goes back to what I said, make sure your financials are right. Make sure you're tracking those things because really they're not lending to your business. They're not lending to your awesome opportunity. They're lending to you. They have to believe you're gonna execute. Uh, so you wanna make sure you put your best foot forward. And there's a lot of work that goes into doing that, but if, if you do it, you can get uh, bank funding or find some other way to get funding. Yeah, I'm, and just to touch on that too, look for the silver lining in some of these other jobs that don't seem like they're helping you build what you want to do because there's probably a strategic element there that you may not even see. If you think outside the box, there might be people that you can hire, some networking you can do with that cable job. Um, like Nathan, we, we were doing consulting to keep the door, we, we had a vision to build a software platform and we did that in parallel, but we did what we had to do and leveraged our expertise at the time to fund the work, right? So look at it from the standpoint of you're funding the work that you want to do, but there may be other relationships in those deals that you get, but you have to do it, right? At the end of the day, cash is king. Okay. I know we're running out of time here. Yeah, we, we've got a 30 minute break, so we can go a little bit over. Okay. So. Um, I'd just like to mention that uh, as a business owner, things don't happen without your staff. And always take the time to thank your staff for the job that they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do that right now. Thank you, Scott, for all the things you do for our company. <laughs> Scott, you, you can pay him after the, after the session. <laughs> all right, any other questions? Oh, we got one coming up. Hello. Uh, speaking of staff, what are the qualities that you see in your staff that will show they have, uh, I'm talking about technical staff, they have the vision of the business. Like. Mm. 
So, I, so technical staff, so specifically talking about technical staff, yes. um, the questions they ask. Because a lot of times you're anybody, but the, like we, we were talking about an opportunity Whisper has in front of us through my entire company. All 78 employees were in there. And I had a couple people ask very, very specific questions. And I could tell that they were thinking, right? They were thinking not, oh, wow, this is awesome. They were thinking, well, how are we going to pull this off? And what are we going to do? And, and, and thinking down, down the road on the business side. Because the business side, you're managing more than just what technology have I chosen and how do I implement it. Uh, you're thinking, predicting, trying to say, how am I going to pull this off and what am I going to implement? Mm -hmm. um, so when you have a technical person that's able to say, you know what, we're going to put this in, but the reason I'm doing this is because it allows me to do this, this, and this down the road when we grow. Those are the people that are more than just a, you said to do what? Yeah. Hey, I got it done. You want the people that are asking the right questions. And when they put, start connecting the dots the way you see you're connecting the dots, then that's yeah. somebody who's, who's very powerful to help you grow where you need to go. Yeah, to, to touch on that, it's specifically with technical people. Also understand that some technical people are going to be incredible uh, assets to the company, but they don't necessarily have that vision. But the, the initial ones that you hire and the initial folks that you want to put in place have that rare ability to do both. Execute, um, but then also ask the questions that are about the business, because ultimately they'll become the leaders of the groups. Um, great example, we have... Uh, um, somebody we hired out of school is now my VP of engineering, um, and he, he was literally graduated out of school um, back in 07, and he's now my VP of engineering, has a team of eight or ten folks that report directly into him, um, because he, you, you, you can tell the guys that ask that question now. That being said, folks that are in the staff, some of the folks you, you absolutely need is law of numbers that they just execute on what you tell them to do. And they're incredibly valuable too. No, no, not everybody has to be a leader. So just keep that in mind. Okay. For us, um, first thing is our, who we can hire for our industry is fairly limited. Um, I can't go to the local union hall and order up five installers. Uh, so I have taught at our local community college for 20 some years and I, I don't advertise it, but it's a technical class. It's net plus, if anybody knows what that is. It's just a technical class. And uh, I have a 16-week interview for 6 to 12 people. Um, I generally bring them on on one of the entry-level positions. I'm up front with them and say, you're on a position that uh, tier one telephone support. In three years, you'll either burn yourself out and quit, or you're going to promote yourself to another, another position within the company. It's your choice. And they develop themselves. If you have the opportunity to hire a very skilled person, it's, we haven't had that, um, and we haven't needed it. We've been able to grow by training them from the ground up. Uh, the other thing I do is I actually I hire... 16 year olds out of high school for the summer. I call it an internship program. I made a conscious effort. Every year we bring on one to three uh, kids. I commit to them for the year. Their requirements are fairly simple. You show up on time, you're gonna work 40 hours a week, do what you're told. Uh, if they don't work out, we don't bring them back the next year. Uh, finally got my first graduate, I guess, if you wanna say from the internship program, he did three, four summers with us, went to a two-year technical school, graduated, went to work for us, and I immediately had 100% trained field tech. We started him out at uh, decent pay, really decent pay. He's, I mean, kid's 20. Uh, he has a vehicle, company phone, company computer, uh, good pay, more than a lot of people do, um, but we trained him. So we've been, we, I have a I guess a training program or an internship program. That's cool. All right, we got time for one more question. Right, is that it? Okay, any other questions from anybody? All right, if not, thank you very much. Thank you.